Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the TF Podcast, where we talk technology, finance, and usually that revolves uh, Bitcoin, crypto, and blockchain. Uh, my name is Jonathan G. Blanco. Please make sure that you're following us on Twitter. Uh, I'm at, John, at JG Product uh, or at TF Blockchain, uh, as well as make sure that you're following on our YouTube. I'm really excited for my next guest. Uh, his name is David Segura. We've had him speak at our conferences in the past, uh, at our TF conferences, and uh, it's good to, to see him at least on video. <laughs> Dave, if you could uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody, please. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm David Segura, and I'm an entrepreneur and investor based in New York. So right now, just like all of you, I'm at home just kind of weathering the storm, uh, getting through it okay, healthy. Um, so I have no complaints overall. That's good. That's good. Um, I'm I, like I was telling you this before we recorded. I, I'm missing your 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 foodie picks because you're you're you, you always have great. I always like to follow the things you're doing, but I, we're gonna have to get you to start doing like the home cooking ones because you're saying that you're cooking more. So those are less exciting. I mean, just to put that <laughs> in context, I like to go out to eat, like to have fun, but at a necessity, was kind of forced to start cooking for myself. But literally before coronavirus, the first the last time I cooked rather was 2010 in Los Angeles. Um, burned some eggs and I just decided right there and then, have a very extreme personality, never again. And I meant to keep that, but now this has happened, I'm cooking again. Um, actually not bad, but not good either. So I'll put it that way. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a long time, 2010. All yeah. right, well, then you're gonna, be co- you're gonna be cooking now for 10 years. Um, well, David, uh, <clears throat> I'd love you to go a little bit into your background. I know you've, you've been an entrepreneur, you've been an investor. Uh, take us through that really quickly. Um, you had a company that you, you had uh, gotten acquired a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try my best to condense it. But basically, grew up in El Paso, um, decided I wanted to leave for a bigger city. So I went to college at University of Chicago. Loved it, but it was just too damn cold. Uh, just to be honest, Chicago's a great city, but a little, little cold. Um, so when I had a chance, I moved out to Los Angeles to be a, a management consultant, worked at a company called Towers Perrin that has since been merged several times and is trading as something else now. Had a good experience, but you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs, big corporate life just wasn't for me. It wasn't a good fit for, for both sides. So I decided at that point to jump into startups. Worked at a mobile content company in Los Angeles, enjoyed that. Company got acquired. Um, I, was too, I was too low in the totem pole to really have made a substantial difference there at Twistbox Entertainment, but it kind of showed me the ropes and introduced me to the chaos that is startups. And I actually found out that I liked it and it was definitely for me. Um, so after that, jumped to comedy.com. Um, that was a kind of a different experience, although I really loved the team, including the CEO, Dean Valentine. But there I started to get, to get the itch that it could be done differently and started mm-hmm. experimenting on the side, both after work and to a lesser extent before work. And eventually, it's kind of like a private joke between me and my co-founder, I called the company Giant Media. And the whole idea or the whole funny joke was that it's just two guys. But the whole genesis of that business was that we were essentially trying to build a media company that would distribute you know, video content for big brands like Nissan, American Express, and a whole bunch of others. And believe it or not, our big insight is that Facebook was legit and it was a legitimate source of, of you know, audience essentially through apps and games which yeah. they're really trying to prioritize so after some and, and, and this i mean and i'm assuming this was at the beginning time of that with facebook right where people probably weren't taking it quite as seriously yeah so you know it was 2009 so they were they were already large and big by that point and they had just gone public i believe but at the same time for whatever reason a lot of brands just didn't really see that as like a great place to like you know be featured and kind of you know be involved with and we were one of the first companies to realize that no, video content, almost any type of content needs to be here because this is where the eyeballs have migrated to. And yeah. as a result of that, just having that central insight, we built a really great business doing that. Yeah, super interesting. Can you walk me through real quick on the distribution side? So like, what were you offering to these brands that they couldn't do on their own? Yeah, that's a great question. So back then, the big video play used to be what they called pre-roll. So there was these huge publicly traded networks like Bright Roll and Tremor that kind of emerged to run commercials before video content that you, you wanted to watch, whether it's like sports stuff on ESPN or something different. Um, where we kind of came into play is that we were one of the first companies to jump into what they called native video. So essentially running video in stream and running video in such a way that 
you know, it was easy to discover. And from beginning to end, it was branded video content. So we kind of got some inspiration from some European companies, believe it or not, one in France called Teeds and the other in London called Unruly Media and kind of seeing what they did well and what they didn't do well. We, we just really kind of built out really good supply with publishers, folks like Pop Sugar, Sports Illustrated, and then a ton of more, more longer tail apps and games that we thought would be a great place to feature video. So the model was cool. It was basically we would charge cost per video view between 20, 25 cents. And the rule of thumb is that internally our ad ops could manage it in such a way that we could manage for our margins to be 50% of every single video, uh, every single video campaign. So as a result of just like scaling that up, we became yeah. pretty profitable and um, had a great exit in 2014. Nice, nice. Did you have to stay with the exit company for a few years? Or yeah, the company so, that acquired you, I mean? Yeah, so Ad Knowledge um, is an interesting company, kind of like an ad tech uh, conglomerate of sorts. They've raised probably $350 million uh, since inception from folks like TPG, and JMI and a lot of the really big kind of tech tech growth um, investment firms. And long story short, I had a three year contract and you know, there was more money to be made had I stayed for all three years. I made it for about a year and a half and I decided at that point that I wanted to kind of jump out after having had to move from LA to New York City and just maybe focus on learning some new skills and also doing a lot of investing. And mm -hmm. for the most part since that time, that's really what's, what's occupied my time investments and so forth exactly yeah so uh let's let's dive right into that so so as an investor what's kind of your uh overall thesis what are what do you like to look for it's a great question so i have to be candid i get a lot of pushback about that because a lot of people that try to track my network of investments which at this point are over 40 plus have a really hard time finding out like what's the, what's your thesis or what's the coherence so for someone like me you know i'm like a high energy ADHD person, it makes sense. It's all early stage. It's all kind of pre-seed and seed level. Sure, I'll do follow-on rounds, but primarily that's where I stay involved. Now, where it confuses people is that some of these companies are in fintech or crypto, companies like Origin Protocol, you know, companies like Trust Token. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, there's also companies like in the cannabis space, like Ease, a company that I'm very excited about and continue to believe in. A lot of consumer companies like Grove Collaborative and Hawthorne. And that can be a little, not necessarily off-putting, but confusing to people. But in my mind, I think there's some harmony there. I'm just looking for great founders that are chasing big market opportunities. Um, I've learned, you know, power law is definitely in effect. A lot of these companies, unfortunately, won't work out. But the ones that do um, should yield a great return. And all of them make for a great learning experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and so, you know, with a couple, you, you've kind of like, you, you seem to be more of like a hands-on, well, I guess I'm, I'm assuming it probably depends on the company of source, but you seem like a more hands-on uh, investor. Uh, you know, I love kind of your thoughts on, on that overall, like when investors are hands-on, hands-off uh, type of thing and like why you like to be hands-on on some of these companies. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. So I'd say this, like, you know, a lot of VCs, depending who they are and what their work style is, do add a lot of value. You could say that they're hands-on, but you know, the setup is very different. If you're operating a large fund, I mean, you're really being ex like compensated essentially to find new investment opportunities, maximize that return for LPs, and for the most part, just kind of see how things play out and maybe support like the winners or the breakaway companies. But it kind of ceases to be anything else in that. Whereas for me, you know, I've primarily been an angel investor. Recently, I've also started operating some syndicates, which are kind of nice because they give me some of the upside or economics of being a VC without actually having to commit to, you know, running a micro fund. Mm -hmm. So I just like, you know, entrepreneurs. I really like the story to some extent. It allows me to live vicariously through them and I'm personable. So I've just, I've noticed that I tend to hit it off, especially with first time founders. Um, maybe they have more questions and they're reluctant to ask like some of the VC partners. I don't know. But I've let it be known that I'm available, whether it's a formal thing or informal, and I'm always happy to help. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'd love to tie that into what's coming on and what's going on today, uh, you know, right now. Uh, so obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and the markets have been really crazy. Um, you know, a month ago, I would have said like, hey, no one wants to, you know, spend because uh, the stock market is down. But, it, you know, it seems to be slowly coming up. 
yeah. and then you know the Bitcoin markets obviously got done. Um, you know, it's it's erased its loss, but you know it pe- it seems as though n- the narrative is that investors or VC or even angels uh, are still hesitant to write deals right now. And I'm, I'm I'd, I'd be curious mm-hmm. to understand you know what your thoughts are on that. Like, are you hesitant yourself? And then you know what are you seeing uh, from you know colleagues and and partners and so forth. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, so I say this, when the pandemic hit, I still remember top of the market, February 21st, you know, ever since then, it's been pretty volatile, you know, to your point, it dropped immediately, but then it started coming up weirdly in the last um, five weeks or so, which, you know, I'll take, I'm grateful for it. Um, but at the same time, just the tumult and kind of the nature of the downturn, it's really being expressed in two ways, in my opinion. There's one is the market and the other is the economy. And I feel like while the market is kind of weirdly being balanced, uh, maybe in part by the Fed's intervention, which, you know, maybe is wise, maybe isn't. I, I couldn't say myself. But meanwhile, the economy is struggling a bit. You know, people are trying to do some belt tightening. Consumers are probably spending less. So my personal read on it, and this is just my opinion, of course, is that most people have pulled back from investing. Yeah. Um, they won't publicly say that um, because they don't want to, like, miss out on deal flow. But most investors, you know, I can definitely tell you that I've, I've heard from a lot of folks that I talk to, you know, regularly, but I wouldn't say like often or even super frequently, but they're all pinging me to get introductions to some of my portfolio companies because they're literally trying to act, um, add value to their active portfolio. So that tells me that like, you know, everyone right now is kind of scrambling to support some of their stronger early stage uh, portfolio companies and they really want them to kind of batter down the hatch. Um, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, it's taking longer to raise money. and Investors are in a lot of cases either uh, renegotiating or, or demanding substantial valuation cuts, and I've seen that a number of times. Yeah, um, what are your thoughts on that overall? Like, is that is that a, a combination of just supply and demand um, in in asking for those valuation cuts? Is that uh, investors just kind of um, uh, exerting their um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I call it taking advantage of a situation for a back of, a lack of a better way to say it. Or is it like, yeah, I mean, cause the risk profile of the company is not necessarily, well, I guess you could say it is less uh, or sorry, is higher as a result of it, but arguably sure. they wouldn't necessarily want to invest in that company anyway. I guess where I'm trying to go with this is that like, if you're concerned about the risk profile of the company that you're investing in, um, then maybe you just wouldn't do the deal altogether. But like, if you're still willing to write the check, like, I guess I'm, maybe it's because I'm looking at it from the entrepreneurial side, <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, like trying to dictate le- uh, less favorable terms to the, to the entrepreneur, if you're invested enough that you think it's going to be a hit and that's why you're investing. It seems kind of off. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like there's difficult, there's definitely like an ethical like conundrum there. And it's been to be clear, like as an angel or even a syndicate lead, you know, I'm not typically investing enough to dictate terms or, you know, be in a position of negotiation. It's more or less just trying to get into good deals and develop a good rapport with the founders and and just moving forward. So definitely, definitely not going to name names, but I'll just say that the way it was explained to me is I kind of brought up that same question. Was this opportunistic? You know, because that's what it felt like. Yeah. But with this investor, you know, what she told me specifically is like, look, you know, I'm a fiduciary. I got LPs to look after. And at the end of the day, if we mutually agree, you know, the founders and myself, that we're going to have to revise projections. In other words, maybe profits, both in the interim and the long term, I should say, um, are impacted, then like that means the company is worth less. So the way she explained it is that this 30% haircut isn't me using my leverage. It's essentially me just exercising like good diligence and them agreeing that like their going forward plan is substantially different than they might have thought. And I've heard that. It's fair you know, a few times now. And so whether or not like people buy that is another thing, but it's happening just straight up. Like people are aggressively renegotiating. Yeah. Um, do you think, so what would your advice be to founders in this scenario? Like, is it, um, you know, maybe don't fundraise right now unless you absolutely have to, if like focus on revenue, like what's, what's your advice to founders right now? So I'll say this, like most people I know that can afford not to raise money, aren't raising money. And I think that just goes without saying that that's probably wise. I mean, it's not like it's impossible, but it's much yeah. harder, yeah. extremely difficult terms, like more power to you. 
So really, I think the founders that kind of need, need the advice or, or need some more feedback are the ones that have to raise. There are a lot of companies which, you know, people kind of, you know, I don't know what they think, but the reality is early stage companies are always kind of cutting it a little close. It's not that unusual to be like under a year and, and burn left, maybe as little as six months. And so what I've tried to tell people, whether they're my portfolio companies or not, because I do get asked this question a lot, is that if you have a solid relationship with some of your angel investors and some of your early stage investors, which can oftentimes be micro funds or smaller funds, go back to them and try to do a convertible round, a bridge note, whatever you want to call it to kind of get you through, you know, this, this year, maybe get an additional six months or so. And then um, hopefully the metrics like look great. You continue building your business in a way that makes sense. And then you'll be in a position to do like a, you know, a proper round or a larger round next year. In other words, just survive, but yeah, yeah that's the advice. Yeah. So got it. So like, so don't, don't dictate or sorry, don't, don't set um, like valuation, like just try to make it based off convertible and have that valuation, kick the, kick the valuation conversation down the road, but just get the cash. I think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the way you summed it up makes more sense. I mean, the reason why I think it's really important though, is that whether it's convertible or bridge, like that's not the most important takeaway. It's like you said, it's just about kicking the can down the road and surviving. But everyone I've talked to, I could tell kind of either agreed with this or felt they should do something, but were somewhat paralyzed either by like wanting to minimize how bad the pandemic was or how they themselves and their company would be different. But the reality is most people will be caught up in this. Most people aren't notion. And so as a result of that, um, you need to act quickly and do whatever you can to make sure that you have that runway to get to better times. Cause these are extraordinary times that could, you know, uh, knock anyone off the block. I mean, great companies, great entrepreneurs can be, you know, offset and even handicapped by a pandemic. That's not really that surprising. So you need right. to take experience with more speed. Yeah. Uh, as someone who has sold a company uh, before, what are your thoughts on like a, an entrepreneur right now, like attempting to get acquired? Um, is that is that kind of like a reasonable sense of action or is it the same thing where valuation might be uh, cut as a result. Also, if you, you know, are trying to get acquired, assuming yeah. that you're in a position or ready to be acquired. Right. And not, and not necessarily aqua hire, right? Like that's obvious aqua hire. Yeah. Obviously you're going to be pennies on the dollar when you do some aqua hire scenario. So I would say that not only do you run into the same issue, um, you know, raising money from VCs or even angels versus selling a company to, you know, your company to another company, but just speaking from experience, I mean, you know, selling my company was in a lot of ways, both professionally and financially, like, you know, the most exciting and coolest event of my life to some extent, certainly professional life. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, um, it was hard. Like it was a six month grueling process. Um, my CFO was a former investment banker. I worked in consulting. Um, we had other folks on the team with similar backgrounds. Um, but even then, like, you know, ad knowledge and almost any company that buys companies, evaluates like many multiples of however many deals they do a year and those guys were doing about like three three companies a year at one point so what i'm trying to say is that no matter how smart or how determined you are you're overmatched they have like a bigger team and it's exhausting and it's grueling it takes your eye off the ball in terms of your business right. um, it is intense and it's all-encompassing and i can't imagine trying to do that while a pandemic is most likely unless you're in a very weird situation um, taking a toll on your business already. So I think in a vacuum, something like that would make sense. But speaking from experience, a company would be in an even better position to use leverage or whatever you want to call it to like extract painfully, painfully, um, you know, skewed terms. So I'd probably try to avoid it unless the conversations are in depth. You know, that, that's, that's what makes the most sense, I think. Okay. I, I can see that too. Right. Because yeah, if you're, if you're focusing on a, being acquired, uh, like you're saying, you're taking your eye off the ball because all your energy is, is getting the company ready to fit the need of like that, that company that's coming on. So I mean, the one thing I learned from selling a company and I wish if, and I, you know, I, I do believe is a, it will start another company and I'll have this experience again. But the one thing I learned is the same way you close a big partnership, the same way you close, like in my case for giant Pepsi or American express account, it takes time and it's very relationship driven. So when you're trying to sell your company for tens of millions of dollars, the guys who are the other founders and the corp dev people have to know you, they have to trust you. And I think in the case of giant, it wasn't a coincidence that the most serious bidders uh, were the ones that knew me 
and my co-founder well or some other senior person on our team and that got them a lot more comfortable so this is not something that can be kind of decided it has to be something that's already in progress and you've been kind of working on for some time um, as an example obviously can't name them but one of my portfolio companies actually is pretty deep in an acquisition conversation um, I've been staying abreast of that and kind of trying to help in the background to the extent that I can um, these conversations, at least from what I'm being told, haven't been derailed by the pandemic, although some bidders have pulled back just because their own situation is different. Sure. Um, th but this was underway. It was already kind of months into it before the world changed in late February. So, you know, that's an exception, but, you know, a little bit of a unique situation there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so moving on to the, the crypto and the uh, currency side of things, um, how did you get into crypto to begin with? Was it through investing or were you interested in it before? Yeah, so a lot of um, my success like throughout life just come from being curious and um, on top of that, just meeting people and learning directly from really two things, just like reading a bunch and then also talking to other people. Yeah. So crypto in particular, like the reason I got into it was in 2014. You know, it's not a coincidence that I sold the company that year. And like a lot of founders that have just sold a company, you're literally you know, most entrepreneurs are somewhat struggling. It's, it's not, it's not the, like the super glorified like thing that, you know, people talk about now. It's, okay. It doesn't look like that. It doesn't feel like that either. So when you suddenly succeed, it's for most people, at least me included, a, a surprise. And your lifestyle changes overnight and that can be jarring. So I was literally thinking, how should I allocate some of these assets and start doing all the normal stuff, um, public equities, you know, um, some funds, um, real estate. And one of my friends in LA um, is a guy named, I'm sure you're familiar with, Brock Pierce. Mm. And um, Brock was, you know, listening to what I had to say. And I was asking him, what do you think I should do? And he looked at me <laughs> without skipping a beat and said, I think you should put all of it in Bitcoin. And <laughs> I started laughing and, and I said, yeah, I'm going to do that. But, uh, you know, to his credit, maybe he had a good idea there. Um, but I ended up putting some of it there. And so as a result of that, that gave me skin in the game and an opportunity to learn. Um, I would say that I wasn't like literally over indexed that much. I didn't like spend too much time in the community in part because I left LA, which is a bigger, at least then it was a bigger crypto community than New York and, um, forgot about it until 2017. Mm -hmm. And then come 2017 for a brief minute, I started to believe my own kind of BS and thought like, wow, I really am a genius. And then <laughs> 2017 happened and I, I came back down to earth. And then, you know, my takeaway for blockchain and crypto in general is that it's, it's one category among many. Among many. Um, there are aspects of it that make it incredibly special, as you know. But at the same time, um, it's just like any other startup if you approach it from the standpoint of a company or an investment. In other words, it's really hard. Um, the likelihood of failure is, 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 you know, 90%, just like any other industry. And on top of that as well, um, the speed of how things move is maybe even faster than other categories, whether it's consumer or ad tech for that matter. So mm -hmm. it's been a learning experience, I'll put it that way. Yeah. So when you started finding companies that you were willing to invest in from a, uh, uh, that were crypto based, uh, what was your investment thesis on that? Was it more that you were just focused on like the market opportunity and them as founders as opposed like, like crypto was probably just like a nice to have yeah. type of thing, but you're just more interested in the problem they're trying to solve? and yeah, the ability for, to, to for do the that. most part like i kind of did multiple things there so you know bitcoin has obviously been good to me throughout the years even though it's still volatile i, I think that the overall thesis of being an alternative to gold a great store of value it's still playing out but i think it's well on its way towards establishing that so knock on wood the happening like spurs it even further and mm -hmm. we'll see what happens um but i i did i mean i want to be candid like i did also you know especially 2017 2018 um, some people did it better. Some people that had more of a trading background, I think, pulled it off. But I was dabbling in, like, you know, other coins, like altcoins, as you will. And most of that was a painful experience. Um, I'll yeah. just say that, you know, the market, as you know, got away from everyone. And I, in many cases, was left holding the bag, as they say. So that's when I decided, okay, uh, Bitcoin is something that I'm excited about and understand. There's nothing, no reason to cut and run here. But on the flip side, I think my, I want to limit my future involvement towards investments and teams pursuing, you know, big markets and, and, and great ideas. And that's something I felt a lot more comfortable with. And I've made, you know, a number of investments in that category since then. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's go to Bitcoin because uh, that, that's definitely what's on everybody's mind right now. Sure. Um, you know, it, yeah, like in, in March, it went down to five and now it's already, you know, made that back up and slowly kind of going over there. Over, um, We've hit 10,000 and uh, the halving is coming up in just a couple of days. Um, what, what are kind of your thoughts, feelings, you know, this halving versus last halving, that sort of thing? You know, you've obviously been aware of, of Bitcoin and paying attention for a while. I'd love to hear kind of just your thoughts overall, your point of view. Yeah, so I'll say this, um, you know, obviously it's very difficult to say what will happen uh, both in the near or long term even, but based on, you know, my experience, like it seems like in every happening situation, um, it does have a substantial impact on price. It seems like initially to some extent, there's a bit of a drawback and I know a lot of people are predicting that, but for the most part, um, measured over the course of the year, people are predicting a pretty significant spike. I mean, I'll, I'll just say, I hope so. I mean, obviously like anyone, I want this asset to appreciate, but at the same time, it's, it's difficult for me to, to lay a number out. So one thing I will say, and you know, I don't know how much they want it repeated, but since it's already public, I'll just requote it. You know, I'm an LP at Pantera Capital, um, have been for, for some time now. And I know that, you know, the team there is usually somewhat tight lipped about what they believe because they know whatever they say will be heavily broadcasted. But, you know, they recently said that in their opinion, and they kind of explained why they weren't guaranteeing it or anything, but they were saying that they, they think that this new happening will lead to a price increase by the end of 2021 of 100,000 you know, dollars for Bitcoin. Now, I, I don't know, uh, but I will say that, you know, I'm an LP at Pantera, generally trust their judgment. I know they have a lot of people there that analyze and follow this a lot more closely than I do. And that's their call. So. We'll see what, how it plays out. Yeah, de they're definitely, uh, you know, one of the most respected uh, yeah. in the space when it comes to, um, you know, investing in uh, just in the space overall, right? Because they, they basically operate three different funds, like a venture fund, the uh, mm -hmm. hedge fund, and then, um, or maybe it's two, I don't know. But like, yeah, they actually just had a gentleman on uh, the show a couple of days ago. Uh, Neil Berkowitz, he's the founder of uh, CoinMe, and they just Pantera led a $10 million round uh, for them for, for their Bitcoin um, ATM software that they do. So yeah, that's, that's, there's definitely a lot of good things on that front. I, I agree. Uh, I hope it, I hope they're right on that. <laughs> that, would, <laughs> that would be nice uh, as well. Now, you know, from what do you think overall, uh, just because, you know, you're, you're someone that has kind of um, call it hovered the line of like traditional market and like the crypto market. Like, so, you know, we're saying this and we, we're hoping for that and we agree like that that could likely be the case. You know, what do you think the imp interpretation or the impression is as for the no coiner or someone like outside of Bitcoin? And like, does it matter that maybe they don't see that or like... Is there any responsibility or need to convince like new or sorry, and I'm talking strictly from an investor standpoint, like a okay. VC or uh, that point. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts overall on that? Hmm. Yeah. So I would say this, um, you know, this may not be popular, but at least in my opinion, like I'm, I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of conversions between let's say FinTech and, and crypto more generally. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, think it's a good thing because it opens up the market towards institutional investment. And not only that, VCs who, for whatever reason, didn't feel comfortable doing crypto or anything in the blockchain space are now kind of reimagining some of their thesis to understand that like, oh, decentralized you know, finance, uh, you know, uh, a lot of these principles that people are putting to work are just innovations in the financial space itself, you know, no fee structures, things like that. So. I've been talking to investors, you know, whether it's in Europe or, or the U.S. that are increasingly positioning, you know, crypto and blockchain in this light. And I think it's going to be good for the market overall. And the profile, too, of founders is also evolving. Like they want to basically disrupt, you know, banks, you know, uh, uh, money transmission companies, things like that. And I think everyone has something in common in that side. So at least for me personally, um, I, I want to see more the use cases kind of simplify so that people understand them a little better. That's why, for example, DeFi and what Compound's doing in, in companies like that is just so interesting to me because that's something that anybody can understand. Anybody can understand the utility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in my personal opinion, it may just because I'm not like smart enough to get it, but 
there's been some projects that I think are credible to some extent and have genuinely incredible genius people, but they feel like, and I've been thinking about this for a few years now, like, you know, solutions in search of problems. And, you know, I, I wonder sometimes if they're too esoteric to like truly succeed. And so seeing some of these new projects emerge um, based on some of these blockchains that I think are solving more kind of like everyday problems or attacking specifically incumbent players in the traditional financial category, that's exciting to me as an investor. That's exciting to a lot of investors. And I imagine too, it's also going to drive up the usage from a user perspective too, which is long-term what the space really needs. Yeah, it seems as though like the the maturity has um, grown uh, in the space uh, and, and kind of maturity in every sense of the word, word right? So um, you see a lot more sophisticated founders uh, working on these ideas and some of them, yeah. some, some of those founders that we're working on, you know, kind of like the saving the world aspects or like, you know, screw the man type of thing, but didn't necessarily have the sophistication to really deliver or talk or discuss that. I think we've yeah. seen them go away. And from my perspective, I think it's also those of us um, in crypto and blockchain and Bitcoin, like have also wanted those people to go away anyway. Right. Because like for those of us that are actually, you know, trying to figure this stuff out, uh, it's like, we don't want there to be noise or, or someone to, you know, to, uh, misrepresent you know the, the value so um i agree with that i, I think that we're, we're starting to see like better and better projects um kind of like the that whole analogy like the the foam rises to the top or whatever mm -hmm. so um yeah i think it'll be really interesting um to, to see you know when when you think about um where uh, like Bitcoin, you know, cause I know you're, you're a product person and you really think in a product aspect, like, you know, when you think about like how, uh, Bitcoin has been productized, right. Um, you yeah. know, there's really cool companies like cash app, um, mm -hmm. with how, you know, that you can be, and some people might say that this isn't productizing Bitcoin. I, I consider it to be productizing Bitcoin because there's a product to buy Bitcoin within cash app. Right. And it's, a me it's a meaningful part of their revenue. Uh, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but they just announced it a couple of days ago. And I want to say it was like, yeah, like 50% of the revenue was, was Bitcoin, something crazy like that. But you know, what, what are some things that you like um, from a productization standpoint when you think about Bitcoin or, um, you know, kind of how you, how you look at that. Cause there's some people that might say things like, Hey, like, you know, own your keys, own your wallet, which don't get me wrong. I'm, 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 I think that that's important, but obviously that doesn't really scale either. Um, so I, I love your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I'll say this, like there's different strokes for different folks. And I think people that are more sophisticated can afford take their own custody over things and what have you. Um, one of my engineering friends, for example, told me that he didn't really see those kind of things as problems because engineers are very careful, I guess. But I think he means like a very specific sort of engineer. That's a big assumption. And it's also a small market. So what I like are use cases that basically democratize access to mm -hmm. what I think is just a very important asset class. So without like tuning my own horn too much, because I don't actually have like a stake in, in the company, but I'll, I'll speak to that anyways. Um, Donut. You know, it's a company that, you know, I'm an advisor to. I met them through my involvement in German Accelerator, which is a really cool organization that was started by Angela Merkel and her government to help mm -hmm. German entrepreneurs expand their business to either the U.S. or Southeast Asia. So Germany is plainly signaling that like, oh, the EU is growth this long. We got to find it elsewhere. So they're trying to export their people now um, to different places. So long story short, um, Donut is essentially building an acorns for crypto. And their whole argument is that, hey, use Roundup so that we use your spare change and invest it into Bitcoin or alternatively set really simple, easy, you know, kind of reoccurring purchases. That's the core product. Yeah. And I think they want, they should, in my personal opinion um, is that they should lean into this more, but they're very preoccupied with like get Bitcoin because Bitcoin's great. But I think the bigger argument here is that in Bitcoin, you know, it's essentially digital money, it's digital currency. And that is a substantial and very new asset class. In other words, whether you think it's real or not, because a lot of people are skeptical and maybe even rightly so, you're going to feel really dumb if this actually does become a significant hedge to inflation, um, a, a, you know, alternative store of value and an alternative to gold. If it is those things, you need some exposure. If you're not sure, at least get some. And what this app does, which I think is brilliant, is that it kind of does it in like an automated way. 
Sure. And the reason why this product is cool is to address some, one of the comments you made earlier. Um, the custodial solution is, is handled, you know, by donut. Um, while there is some platform risk there, they're the ones that basically take custody. Uh, they're the ones that make these, you know, purchases on your behalf in a pulled basis every single week. If you want some sort of interest or, you know, essentially a DeFi product, um, they have a partnership with Compound, which allows them to get the best rate from that lending pool. As, as based on what's available. So I think those kind of use cases like, hey, do you want a piece of this new exciting emerging asset class? I think you should just for financial planning purposes. Okay. Yeah. Do you want a better interest rate than you can get from B of A or Wells Fargo? Yeah. Okay, cool. You can do that through us. So in other words, something that is crypto, but at the same time, personal finance, fintech, I think that's a really cool use case and just one example of something that's demystifying you know, what to some people is just incomprehensible and too complex to want to get involved in. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, like just, I, I'm a, the, um, the interest aspect of it is so, so interesting, right? Like, uh, yeah. and the fact that it's the interest that one can earn is so much higher than any bank, you know? So it's like, just for that alone, uh, you know, I think there's, there's definitely some, some really interesting opportunities, uh, overall. And, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the payment space. You know, I, I, I like what, what Dona is doing. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been saying that for a while, like someone needs to come up with an acorn of, of it. So I'm glad, glad someone did I actually try to get a buddy of mine to, to build it with me. And he's like, Oh, I don't think that would work. And so I, the, when I found out about Dona, I was like, here, see, told you, <laughs> but <laughs> Um, well, cool, man. Well, you know, one thing I'd love to do before we end and wrap is, you know, I'd love to give you the opportunity to ask a question to everybody else. What's a question that, uh, you would like people to kind of think about as they go about their day that you want to ask them? Hmm. Question to think about as they go about their day. Um, I don't know. There's two ways to answer that. Like there's a question that I have and there's a question that I think other people should contemplate. All right. Let's do both of them. Okay. Um, I guess the question that I have, and I'm always very curious to talk to everyone in crypto and blockchain, is this is a very enthusiastic community, more mm -hmm. so than a lot of other industry sectors. So people tend to have like incredibly well-researched opinions and you hear different ones, sometimes competing ones. And I think that's fa fascinating. So honestly, without being that guy, I actually am very curious as to like what people think about, you know, uh, Bitcoin, uh, where is it going end of 2020? and beyond and why I've heard some things that I think are strange and I've heard some things that are very insightful and interesting. I mean, it's hard to say like what's right, what's wrong, but um, I'm always curious to gather more information. So that's the one question I have for the community in general. And then in terms of, you know, advice or what have you, you know, whether you're a founder, a, a team member or an investor in the space, I just think that it's important to think of the different types of audience that, exist and have to emerge for this to really be a widespread industry. And what I mean by that is I think there's some incredible products out there that we're all excited about that use the best, you know, technologies and aspects of decentralization that we're, we're currently aware of and some very, you know, complex, let's say governance issues and what have you. But some of these things aren't considered pressing or immediate to a very substantial amount of, of users, I think. And so in order to draw more people in, I do think, there needs to be more technologies, more apps that are kind of built to satisfy this kind of more, I hate to say it, but casual user. And I think there's a lot of opportunity around that. There's a lot of money to be made and there's a lot of value importantly to be delivered to those people. So for me personally, just speaking as like a community enthusiast and also a potential investor, I'm really curious to see people that can democratize for lack of a better term, you know, blockchain and, 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 and the technologies. And if they can do that, I think that's going to be like a, a huge opportunity in every sense of the word. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, well, David, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, what are some good ways that people can stay in touch with you, follow you, stay in contact? Sure, definitely. Um, well, for fun, definitely Instagram. <laughs> uh, well, there's not as many exciting things happening there, but you can find me at dseg10, D-S-E-G-1-0. And then also in terms of email, um, the email that probably makes the most sense would be my work email. That's David at Spectrum Ventures. And, you know, um, I'm pretty responsive there. So feel free to send me an email anytime. Um, there's no LPs, just me. But 
you know, I'm always happy to take a look and add value wherever I can. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody, thank you for listening to another episode of the TF podcast. Again, please make sure that you are subscribed um, wherever you listen to podcasts as well as on YouTube to watch this video. Um, and please make sure that you're following us on Twitter. I'm at JG product uh, and there's at TF uh, blockchain. Uh, we appreciate the reviews. Uh, fill those stars up uh, if you enjoyed this and please share with your friends and colleagues and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks a lot for, for listening and watching.